Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Reds Rundown podcast. This is by two lifelong Reds fans and journalists. I'm Rob. He's Joe. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Joe, you and I had a lengthy discussion already about this, but uh, the first two things we'll talk about this weekend are the Bengals. How was your weekend aside from that? That's good. College football was awesome. Uh, a couple of my teams lost, but uh, it's what's making you love makes you love the sport is just that it has upsets and there's a lot of fun stuff going on. Um, yeah, just you know, like I said, I'm excited to have football on all weekend with NFL coming back despite the Bengals' loss. Yeah, we're going to have to hope and pray that that one was just an accident. Uh, and that leads us into the question of the day, Joe. Who will have a better season, the 2024 Reds or the 2024-2025 Bengals? Uh, we are going to answer this one now. Normally we wait, but we're not going to talk about the Bengals later on this podcast. So, Joe, I am gonna, I'm going to start this one. You're the expert in football. If you guys don't know this, Joe is truly uh a a genius when it comes to the football world i trust him immensely when it comes to my thoughts on the nfl um i will say this i think the Bengals will ultimately be better because at least they'll be over 500 but my expectations will be equal equally sad for both and i mean that where i expected the reds to make the playoffs and maybe make a run just for fun i expect the Bengals to potentially reach a super bowl this year and after Sunday's performance, uh, my expectations are a little low, but not completely dashed. But I will say that ultimately, if the Bengals do not at least make a run in the playoffs, my sadness will be equal for both. Yeah, I think the Bengals will have the better season. Uh, they'll make the playoffs with what they've done. That is probably a reasonable expectation to make the playoffs and then win a game. It probably isn't reasonable to expect a Super Bowl unless you expect... Joe Burrow just to be a hero and other parts of the team to really improve um, from what they're shared in the opening week. Um, it is sad for Cincinnati fans that we have the two poorest owners in their respective sports and they continually don't spend their money for the Reds. Always some of the lowest payroll. We're not extending some of these players that we talked about with Ellie and Matt McClain, all these guys. Um, you know, Hunter Green getting extended was a good step. We'll see if they make those, those kind of next steps here. And for the Bengals, still having like $20 million in cap space, not extending Jamar Chase. It is sad that these teams are so similar in how they operate and have been similarly disappointing. Um, you take out Joe Burrow uh, taking the team to a Super Bowl and maybe lucking out and drafting Joe Burrow number one overall, and it's been 21st century or since 1995. Um, it's been pretty It's been pretty rough. But Reds have the worst uh, playoff drought in terms of advancing in the postseason since 1995 is the last time they did it. Bengals made the Super Bowl a couple years ago. They made the AFC Championship after that. Um, but you want to see sustained success. I think they can get make the playoffs this year, but they need to probably add more to the roster and, and to be able to win this, you know, the Super Bowl. And then see, the funny thing is, same thing for the Reds. We want to see them make some big acquisitions. Uh, and it's just it's kind of weird. Cincinnati teams kind of have the same, I don't know, same little problems and issues. Yeah, even we'll see if FC Cincinnati starts to have those, although they've been uh, pretty decent about acquiring people. From what I have known, I'm not an expert in the world of soccer slash football, but it is a uh, it is good to see at least one team going out there and trying. And um, I'm not saying the Reds and Bengals aren't trying. They're just doing it in a weird way, it feels like. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to see about that. But we'll move on here, Joe, to our Astros and Mets series. It was a weird good week for the reds this week um i don't know how else to describe it but um game one here a 5-3 win for the reds we used two starters but for only two innings plus two innings plus uh with julian aguiar and carson spires uh, both also the only ones to give up runs which was interesting but um the reds are truly just doing everything by committee ty france started his hellaciously awesome week um don't know if that's the right phrasing, but you know what I mean. Four four hits in this game, um, including a big RBI for Ty France. Uh, Justin Wilson getting the save. Um, just to give him a little credit. They brought him in to get uh, the big bapa, Jordan Alvarez, and he got it done. So good on him. Uh, then the Reds go on to absolutely smack the Astros, putting up nine runs in the first inning. I was listening to this in the car, Joe, and I couldn't believe how the Reds were just stringing together hit after hit after hit. Um, Ty France going with three hits in this one. A big home run from Jonathan India that was crushed. Um, Ellie with two big doubles as well. 
Uh, Nick Martinez pitched well, and then Brent Suter came back to pitch uh, the last three innings, which, considering how we've been using our bullpen, that was massive uh, for the Reds, to be honest with you. Um, then they would go on to sweep the Astros in a one nothing uh, game, Joe, where we saw Rhett Lauder really pitch well. Tony Santon came in, and Alex Diaz got the job done. The big hit being Ty France again with a mammoth home run on the left field. Uh, probably the m- most convincing home run I've seen him hit all year with the Reds. Um, it's been very fun to watch him, I think, succeed. Then we went to the Mets. We played him well, uh, kept it tied uh, going into um, going into the ninth inning, uh, but it ultimately was not enough. Uh, Brandon Williamson came back and threw, I think, very well in this game. Honestly, 4.2 innings pitched. Only one run given up, uh, one walk, one strikeout. But uh, Justin Wilson could not hold it down. Um, L.A. De La Cruz with a big home run, uh, right-handed. By the way, that was an s- absolute shot. Probably one of his best hits right-handed uh, in terms of just pure power that I've seen. Uh, T.J. Friedel also with a big home run. Um, but the Reds ultimately drop it. You head into the Saturday game. Uh, the Reds drop it for nothing after Jacob Junis pitches extremely well. Sam Mole gives up some runs. Uh, ultimately ends up going on the IL after this game as well. Um, They could get nothing done against Jose Quintana for the second time this season. Then we head into the Sunday game, Joe. Uh, It was a good one, honestly, for the Reds. Uh, Julian Aguiar yet again pitching pretty well in this one. Uh, The bullpen did their job, um, including another save for Alex Diaz. Uh, Ultimately, it would be uh, Espinal with a big double in the ninth inning. Uh, Marte also got a big hit in the first inning, but um, the Reds would end up going, would win three to one and uh, end up going four and two um, on the weekend or on the week, Joe. Um, Obviously they're still, they're still technically in the playoff race, but we know there's, there's really no hope there. At least in that it's good to just see some guys doing some stuff. What was your general thoughts on these series, Joe? Um, What did you see? It's funny how well the how the Reds have owned the Astros since they've left the NL Central. Uh, we haven't lost a game to them, I believe, yet. Is I believe that's correct. I um, mean, not just that, but we also got the Astros killer in Ty France on the team just by happenstance, and uh, he goes absolutely berserk during these games. We need to get the Reds to a World Series so we can beat the Astros and everyone can rally behind the Reds because a lot of people still hate the Astros after that cheating scandal, um, which is fair, and I agree with. Um, no, this uh, these series, I mean, it was interesting that they, they swept the Astros. Um, you know, the Mets are kind of on a tear. We've talked about the they started off the season slow, and then now they're in a tie for the playoff, last playoff spot with the Braves, who we match up with uh, today, who we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, I... I liked what I saw from Rhett Lauder. Um, I'm excited to see him continue to grow. I still don't really necessarily agree with the decision to bring him up and waste that year of control, uh, but it's good to see him pitch well despite that. And then I do think that uh, what you mentioned with Ty France, it's he has earned the right, I think, maybe not to be the starting first baseman, but to at least be in the conversation this offseason to see how he does in spring training. Uh, unless we, like I said last week with Santiago Espinal, who's still doing okay, um, they... They, if they sign a good corner infielder, maybe their jobs are in jeopardy, but they look like the two front runners to be the guys who start there. And we'll see how the young guys fill in with CES and Nuelve Marte. Uh, that is the biggest thing is like, you know, hey, this Ty France was maybe not the best acquisition at the deadline for going for it this year or for, uh, you know, really helping this team out for this season. But at the end of the day, he might be a guy who can be a piece in the future. I just wish the Reds front office would have been more upfront about, hey, We've got this guy who was, you know, basically designated for assignment. He can be a key part to this team. He's not going to be the guy who pushes this team over the edge to help this year. Uh, I think expectations with that are maybe a little bit different. So I think that's the that's the thing I've noticed the most. I, I haven't really noticed much with the pitching outside of Louder. I think it's been just a hodgepodge of having to throw guys into situations maybe they're not ready for or maybe too soon or maybe bullpen days. And it's, you know, something I don't think we have a lot to take away from. Uh, but Red Louder and I think Ty France are the two two stars. I'll also shout out real quick. That's Howard Stevenson batting average up to mm-hmm. 264. Santiago Santiago Espinal 268 still. So and at least still above 260, which is good for his second season in the major leagues. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we'll uh, we'll hop into Red Louder. I think here, Joe, touching on what you were discussing. Um, he is 
doing well so far. Uh, he's got a 0.87 ERA through two games. Um, he's still walking a lot more guys than I think either of us would have would have hoped. He's almost averaging now a strikeout per inning, which after his first game, I I, I think that that's it, he's making a good step. His stuff's moving well. Um, and I think he's pitching out of situations in a pretty good manner. So um, I, I will say right now that that it's it's yes, was it the best? way for him to come up probably not um that being said joe i do think that this is truly his tryout right now and i think he's showing at least to me if he can do this over his next i think he's got three or four starts left through the season um if they you know continue to use him as the starter and not as kind of what they've done with spires and uh everybody else it seems like um if they use him as a starter, he can continue to go five or six innings and get guys out. They'll have more data on him at that point. And if he's still doing what he's doing, I honestly, dude, I, I'm already at the point where I'd be like, all right, let's just put him in there at the four slot for next year and just let the five slot be a battle. Um, I, I, I think that that could be the route to go. Um, I, his stuff is weird. It's, it's very interesting. He's not necessarily overpowering, but he hides it well. Everything seems to move. His changeup is insanely good. He's got a plus curveball as well, or breaking ball, whatever wording you want to use for it. I I will admit, I, I'm impressed. I, I've watched both starts uh, almost all the way through. Um, it's it's pretty good. It's good. And he just doesn't seem like he's intimidated. Like that first inning of his you know major league debut, he definitely looked like he was scared. Like he looked nervous. But this second start especially, he looked like, all right, hey, I'm just coming out here. I'm a big leaguer. I'm going to get get the job done, and he has so far. So um, I will admit, like, while it's, again, not the best situation, Joe, I think he is setting himself up for a 2025 campaign that if this man's our, fi- our fourth starter, we're in a great spot. And if everybody actually stays healthy, then we're in a really good spot. Yeah, I'm with you. I wish they would have tried to – play him last year in some minor league games. And maybe he could have played like since May, like Paul Skeens did, maybe have more of an impact on this team, especially as we had guys like Graham Mascraft struggling, Nick Martinez filling in, um, you know, Frankie Montas struggling as well. We could have had a more powerful rotation. Um, I do really love the Reds. I think I mentioned this earlier in the year. I love the Reds strategy of taking college pitchers. Like when you have a guy like mm-hmm. Hunter Green, obviously you take him. He's a phenom. Uh, but we've talked about Hunter Green having to add extra pitches. The one thing I loved about Louder is he had several effective pitches at Wake Forest, and you could see that changeup really was on a string against mm-hmm. some of those college hitters, and it's started. You could kind of start to see that in the major league level. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think he could definitely be a factor for next year. I wish he would have come up earlier this year or next year, but the middle ground is fine if he's going to get experience. It's just it's you know it makes your playoff or maybe your contender window shorter for a team in the small market. Uh, and the same thing goes for even this year, Chase Burns and some of their other early picks. I would love to see them play in the fall league, or excuse me, play, play the rest of spring training and then play in the fall league and get get their feet wet. Um, I get saving arms is, is big, but I think there's a way you can maybe, you know, pitch them once every seven days or pitch them, you know, three or four innings here or there. It's not like a big thing. And I think that could give you a bit more information about these guys. And it did take, you know, Louder looks good right now, but it did take them you know, four months into the season until he actually started pitching really well. I mean, I think that would help with that as well. So that's something big picture to look at for the future. Uh, I am still a fan of having Rhett Louder compete for a spot in the rotation next year, uh, which I know you mentioned, but also I, I would love to have them sign someone veteran who can actually, you know, invest in someone who's not Frankie Montas coming off an injury, coming off injuries over the last several years, I should say. Uh, and also just like get a guy who can eat innings or maybe be a leader for this starting rotation. Even if they do have, three solid starters at the top of the rotation right now. And then, you know, Brett Louder, you know, some pitching depth behind that. Brett Louder could be a guy. Graham Ashcraft could come back. Nick Martinez, you could put in. Whatever you want to do. I still would like to have one guy who's like a proven winner uh, who can really help us out. Yeah, we're finding that you can never have too many starting pitchers. And if Graham Ashcraft, Brandon Williamson, Nick Martinez, maybe Jacob Junis, who we'll talk about here in a second, can be guys who you can rely on if guys are getting injured or whatever, then... Uh, ultimately that could be, it. I mean, we've seen it even with the Dodgers. I mean, the Dodgers have gone through a thousand starting pitchers. It feels like this year, um, even despite them, you know, having two of the best, uh, Japanese starting pitchers that we've seen in quite a long time. So, um, it's very interesting to watch Joe. There's no doubt about it. Um, I preface this because I wanted to talk about Jacob Junis and Nick Martinez. Now, Jacob Junis, we obviously we got from the trade, 
for Frankie Montas. Um, at this point, I probably should have just kept Frankie, but that is what it is. He's on the team now. He has a mutual option going into next year. Nick Martinez has a player option going into next year. I wanted to ask which one you would want to keep and which one you think will stay, or if either of them will leave or stay, what your opinion is. Because watching Jacob Junis throw multiple really good innings now that he's gotten comfortable with the staff and everything since he's come over has looked good. Nick Martinez has also been great. Um, to be clear, Jacob Junis is making almost half of what Martinez is. So you have to take that into mind as well, Joe. But where are you at uh, with these two players as we look ahead to next year? Because um, sadly, that's pretty much all we have to do now as Reds fans. I'll say I, I would rather have Martinez. I think his versatility has been really clutch this year. I know he started off bad as a starter, but he actually had, you know, he's had some nice starts. I think better as a bullpen pitcher. But um, I think if you're asking me, you know, which one I want is Martinez, but I would keep both. I think this is a bullpen that has needed good pitching. We have had some injuries, whether that, you know, talked about Tony Santion the last couple of years, TJ Antone. Um, you know, we have Ian Jabot. Um, there's, there's guys that, like, we don't have good ideas of how they're going to come back, if they're going to be anything. We traded away Lucas Sims. And Alexis Diaz, we talked about last week, Rob. We don't know if he's going to be the closer next year, if he should be the closer. I would like to keep both these guys because I think they can be good parts of a good bullpen, even if that means we have to go sign, like I said last week, two to three guys for the end of the bullpen, seventh, eighth, ninth inning guys. Having those guys and having the first part locked down, I think helps you not have to go put a whole bullpen together in one offseason. So I would take both back. I think both have been solid in different roles and, and shown some stuff in their time with the Reds. But, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's something that, would really help this offseason if we got both back because it would make less of moves for them to do. I was going to say, I actually think both will stay too because I don't know that Nick Martinez is going to get more on the open market considering his age and just kind of what his role is. Um, I think most people will view him as a bullpen piece, so I don't think they're going to give him as much money. Uh, and I think June is the same way. Uh, he's kind of been a journeyman over the last few years. Uh, I don't know that they're he's going to find another $7 million contract out there. So even though it's technically both in the player's hands to make their choice, because even a mutual option, the Reds can say, hey, we want you back, Jacob Junis. But Jacob Junis could be like, I don't want the Reds. So um, there's a real world where both of them are on this roster moving forward, Joe, and I do think it absolutely helps the Reds. Um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, because, like, again, I think Jabot comes back. There's just no way Justin Wilson makes his team again. Uh, there's just no way. Uh, I'm just going to be honest. And even, like, if they want to let go or, you know, trade away Emilio Pagan, I know he's been a little bit better, but uh, he still scares me a little bit, to be honest, every time he comes in. Uh, it just worries me. They're, they're, they're just some of those guys. So, you know, for me, I've got Sam Mole pretty much locked up, and then maybe these two guys. Um, that might be it for the bull, but maybe Santion too. Santion has been pretty awesome. I, I've He has games here and there, but, like, for the most part, he's been, I think, he reminds me of what Lucas Sims was, maybe, uh, a little bit back in the day. Um, just in terms of a, a lockdown righty, uh, with some good, good sweeping stuff and a solid fastball. So we'll, we'll take that. The last guy that I want to mention today before I know guys, there's not a whole lot for us to talk about necessarily, but, um, we'll, we'll jump into what is ultimately three different teams that we'll play this week, which is wild, but Ty France, Joe, I want to, I want to look into this here. So Ty France has now had 34 games with the Reds, uh, close to, you know, he's 10 games behind half of what he would have been with Seattle. Um, he's got 114 at-bats. He's got 35 hits already. Um, seven doubles, four home runs. The power is starting to show a little bit more. He's definitely more of a singles guy, but, like, I think he has enough power there right now to where they've got they've got him under contract for next year with arbitration, but um, his OPS is an 831. For a guy who's, you know, an undesignated, or a, 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 excuse me, who they, who they got off of essentially waivers, but a trade, uh, is, I think, really impressive. He doesn't strike out a ton. He walks a decent amount. Like, I know you already kind of mentioned it, but I wouldn't hate him going into opening day with a battle with him and CES, and the Reds maybe even switching it up based on what they need. Right? Like, what I'm trying to say is, is like, between him and, and Espinal... 
I really think that there's a world... I, I'm starting to see the train of thought that you had with our Espinal, tra- with our Espinal discussion. Uh, he has continued to hit, Joe. He's been hitting over 300 for almost like a month and a half, two months now. These two guys may not necessarily be big acquisitions, but if you have two guys in the world of baseball this year where nobody is hitting for average, who are both able to hit for 300, I think once, I really honestly, Joe, it's going to sound maybe too much hopium for me, and, and we'll dive into Ty France part of this here in a second, but looking at it in a larger part, I think if our like our top three starting pitchers were all healthy, I think this team might be making a run right now with how much they've actually helped on offense. Stevenson's been hitting better. India's been hitting better. Ellie's been hitting well. Like The offense just came on at the wrong time, unfortunately, and the pitchers got hurt at the worst time. But, I mean, we're not seeing Will Benson in the lineup every day anymore. We're not seeing Noel V. Marte. I'm not giving up on Noel V. Marte by any stretch. But clearly this year is just, he needs a reset in, I think, the worst sort of way next year. I, I was looking at his heat map joe and anything outside is bad just anything the man can hit anything middle and in basically but he can't hit anything outside and people are just going to continue to hammer that that's a skill that a young player can adjust to we saw a eugenio suarez make that adjustment he became a much hitter a much better hitter he still struck out a lot but he became a much better hitter um i'm just giving that as a more recent example but i'll be honest joe like i i if i'm the reds you go and you go get a big bopper outfielder to put at any position, and you start Spencer Steer and TJ Friedel with that guy, and you keep Espinol at third because his defense is insanely good already. You let him bat like 275. You have Noel V. Marte there as a backup. You have CES as a backup there for Ty France. You let him bat 280. Uh, this offense could be very good. Then you get your power from, you know, people like Stevenson, who's seemingly finding it, from Ellie, from Matt McClain when he comes back. You know, like, they may actually end up being the at, like the four average team that we need. It's just, it felt like maybe there were too many guys who we relied on, like, sadly, Will Benson and CES, that just didn't get the job done. Uh, and that just that just, I think, broke down the entire lineup. I don't know. I, I I just I'm watching these games and I'm like, okay, Ty France got another hit. Oh, Ty France got another hit. Espinal got another hit. Like, if those are your guys batting at the back of your lineup once everybody's healthy next year, and like setting up the the top of the order, then you're in a really good position. And and I really truly believe they go out and get one outfielder, like a really good, solid, you know, pretty powerful middle, like at least a five hitter for you. Uh, and they cut candy, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, then I think I think you've got a pretty solid team. And I think Ty France, in my opinion at least, he's done more than what I've seen from most of our other first basemen almost the entire year unless it, it was Spencer Steer. Yeah, I think the interesting thing becomes the roster crunch after that point. Um, you know, I, I, I think right now these two guys, like I said, have at least earned the right to compete for that spot next year. And I mean, with things not being seen yet, because it hasn't happened, they should be the first starting first and third baseman just based on how they played, uh, unless there is a signing. If you do sign that one outfielder, that makes the roster crunch tough. You might need to start CES and OLA Marte and AAA, or one of them, uh, because you still have Jonathan India on the roster, who can play first base, he can play third, you know, he can play a little bit of outfield too, uh, which helps. Uh, and having Steer being able to play multiple positions helps too. Uh, but then if you if you don't cut candy then you have another guy so like you, you got to figure this whole thing out and it probably like i said meant comes off as like maybe you trade candy and and get some cash back that you can use on a different free agent um but that's what's going to be interesting and i don't think the reds should just like hey go sign that that outfielder i don't think that's where you should stop so there might be a time they, they sign a guy who's a first or third baseman i'm fine with that especially if you get these guys off the bench a lot of them you know ty france hasn't started necessarily every day um at least when he first came over santiago espinal hasn't started every game this year there's ways and i think david bell has said this and i think it's actually something i agree with you can get guys at bats on a so somewhat consistent basis where it almost is like they're a starter that's why you need to continue to get depth so that's the thing that comes to mind, but I would love to have a, a team that bats for average. I would love to have guys who have produced getting that chance. And same thing that like happened like last year. Will, Will Benson had a fantastic season last year. I'm happy he got that opportunity this year to yep. start the year. It didn't work out, 
but and, and I think that's the thing is like we have to make sure we pull the cord out faster when things go wrong. Otherwise, you know, if you have someone who's better than Will Benson this year, if you have someone uh, you know better than CES at the start of the year, you have someone who's better than Noel Vey, even though there wasn't much option when he came up, you know, yeah. playing in his position, you might win seven, eight more games. You know, that, that, I don't think they make the playoffs just because the pitcher's being hurt now, but like. That could definitely have an effect on things. So I'm I'm looking forward to next year. I think Ty France, like I said, has earned a spot to uh, to compete. I think uh, Santiago Espinal has you know again been our best player for the second half of the season, um, and you know I want to reward those guys for actually showing up when other people have not. I couldn't agree more. And we'll have to see. Like I said, we'll we'll do more in depth. I think discussions once we get to the off season on roster construction. But for now, I think this was. Uh, just a good time to give them their due again, uh, just because they continue to perform and it's worth discussing at least a little bit where we see them. This week, we have a weird schedule, Joe. Uh, we get the Braves for one game in Atlanta, and then we have uh, games against three games specifically against the Cardinals and the Twins. Um, look, I mean, we know what the Braves roster is. They've been beat to hell, honestly, even with Merrifield getting hurt again. Uh, has has obviously hurt them. They're still playing all right, uh, and they're starting to get some guys back here and there. But like, I I'll be honest with you, I feel bad for the Reds. You're gonna go from New York to Atlanta to St. Louis in a three day stretch, which is really tough. I don't want to dive too deeply into this first game, Joe. I, I I think I think the Reds lose this one. To be honest with you, just because of the amount of traveling that they're gonna have to do, they're not even gonna get really comfortable in Atlanta. They probably, I mean. I don't even know what you do. Like, do you do you just stay in New York so you can get a good night's sleep and then fly down to Atlanta for the game and then just leave right away to go to St. Louis? Like, what do you even do there? Uh, I, I, I don't really know. And then if you want to curtail this into the Cardinals discussion, Cardinals have been playing a little bit better. Pitching has still been a problem for them. Some of their big hitters have not been really stepping up. Uh, we did well against the Cardinals earlier this season. In general, we've been doing pretty well against them lately. Um, I'll, I'll give my predictions really quickly here, Joe. I think we're going to go two and two. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll win two in, uh, St. Louis. We'll drop one. And then I think we'll drop one against the Braves. Yeah. Braves again, team. I want to model the Reds after. And the cool thing about it for, for the Braves, Rob, and I think we would enjoy this. is like, they built the roster where they have had injuries that would cripple almost any other team yeah and they are still fighting for a playoff spot they're tied with the Mets for that last wild card spot so that's cool to see Mm -hmm. want to see us lock up players for contracts like they did when they were young um gonna be a tough game uh Charlie Morton's going for them I think we'll probably lose this one like you said it's tough going from the Mets to the you know to Atlanta over to St. Louis uh so I think we'll probably lose that one and then I'll go um in the in the Cardinal series I will go one and two I'll make it one and three overall for those uh the Cardinals again I mentioned before um, probably doing better than expected. They're still technically in the playoff. Probably going to miss out on it. Real like Mason win at shortstop, but those guys they pay a lot of money to haven't produced in a way that really helps them out this year. And I think that's what really hurts is like those guys haven't produced. They don't have the greatest starting pitching. They're definitely a team that we can beat when we are at full strength or when we, um, you know, maybe I don't know hit better. But <laughs> I don't want to bet on that with our starting pitchers out. So I will I will say one win there. And one and three overall for the first four games of the week. Yeah, that's fair enough. I can't really argue with you on this one at this point because it feels like one and two is the safest bet, unless if you're playing the Astros, apparently. Um, then we get the Twins. We got to go fly up to Minnesota. This week, uh, the Reds will have been in four different cities. Uh, if you count eight days and flying back to Cincinnati, they will have been in five and eight days. So really rough on them traveling wise. And this happens sometimes at the end of the season, you got to get those games in. Um, they'll go against the twins, Joe, who are uh, fighting to keep their spot. They're trying to hold off the Royals right now. They've been a solid team this year overall. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't see the reds going into Minnesota and having a good time. I almost wanted to go Oh three on this series, but I think the reds will scrape out a win here somewhere i don't know maybe it's going to be a rhett louder start where he just does really well and we get a couple big hits from ellie um i know it's not much analysis there's just not much at this point that we can do because we don't even know who's going to be starting these games right now and i think starting pitching makes a huge difference considering like literally not even spires is starting the games 
Uh, Julian Aguilar is going like two innings every game. Brandon Williamson's having a, um, what are they calling those? An opener <laughs> for his games. Like there's just, without consistent starting pitching, there's not a lot that you can really analyze right now because we're just basically doing bullpen games. So I, I hope people understand that. But um, I do think hitting wise, like their pitching has been solid. Um, I think our guys can go in there and, and, at least do some damage, but seeing them win more than one game in Minnesota after they've traveled as much as they have over the last few days, uh, this is a rough stretch for them. There's just no other way around it. And um, yeah, I got them going one and two, which puts them at, what is that? Three. Uh, what did I have them at? I, uh, three and four for the week. There you go. Yeah. I'm going to go one and two in this one too. As much as I, like that the Reds have started off series well this year, and they usually win the opening game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually think this is backwards. I think they'll win the last game of the series. They'll be going up against David Festa, who is – the other two pitchers have an under-4 ERA. David Festa has a 4.75 ERA. It's something that we can take advantage of as we get away there. Um, the Twins are good. They're in that last wild card spot for the AL. Um, maybe not having the season quite they hoped, and they do have some injuries, like including uh, Byron Buxton mm-hmm. and Carlos Again. Correa right now. Don't know – don't know <laughs> – don't know if they'll be back. Uh, they're both on the 10-day injured list, I believe. So um, that could change things, too. But one and two, I think, um, again, we're we're slowly going to keep on losing games down the stretch just because of the pitching situation, even if the hitters are stepping up. Yeah, it's a bummer. It is a bummer. Um, with that, Joe, we've kept the show under an hour for, like, the first time in months. So uh, let's, uh, let's get some words of wisdom in there from you, and then uh, we'll wrap this one up. Yeah, bye-bye, Dom Smith. Your time with the Reds was short. You're a fun player. You're not the greatest, but thank you. You're, you're always fun. Um, and then also, I finished the Pete Rose documentary. I mentioned that the last time. Yep. Uh, it is worth checking out. I said it last time. It is unbelievable how many times that guy shoots himself in his own foot in terms of getting in the Hall of Fame. I do believe that they're planning on putting him in the Hall of Fame after he passes away, which I think is wrong. Either put him in or don't. Uh, but... It's worth checking out for all Reds fans. There's really cool shots of Cincinnati. There's really cool history with the Big Red Machine. Uh, and then you get to, like, I don't know, my parents were like, I, I, there's stuff I'd never heard about the Pete Rose story. My parents were like, oh, I remember that. Like, that, yeah, that was a big part of the story. So <laughs> interesting in that regard. Uh, so definitely check it out. But I also would love to see a documentary in whole about the whole Big Red Machine Reds. We have yeah. so many good 30 for 30s by ESPN. So many good documentaries by HBO. I would love to see just like, you can even get into the Pete Rose stuff. You can get into so many different things about how Pete Rose and Johnny Bench didn't like each other and you know, Sparky Anderson, how he handled the stars versus the regular players. I would love to have a full story of that that is not just like, you know, a low, a thing that we've seen like this a couple minutes here or there. I want to have like a full in-depth documentary. Uh, so this is my kind of final thoughts here. It's like, I've wanted that for a long time. I don't know... I want to do it before some of these older players pass away too. We get their input and, and can actually hear the stories. But um, yeah, I, I would love to see that in the future. Well, especially considering they are considered to be one of the all-time ten you know, best teams ever. Uh, so I would love to see that as well. Uh, I guess maybe I'll give that Pete Rose documentary a uh, a watch now. I'm not a big, you know, I'm not a huge Pete Rose guy myself. So uh, I, I sorry, sorry to all your older listeners. You guys probably hate the show now because of that. I, I don't dis like him necessarily uh, i respect what he did as a baseball player i'll put it that way uh well, well you know, we're gonna have an awesome off-season content when we debate pete rose should he be in the hall of fame then uh, i also not a big fan of pete rose i met him one time and it was not an enjoyable experience for me at four years old and i have stuck with that ever since and uh but i i don't know i, I think that sounds like we, most people, i don't want to get into it yeah it, it does sound like most experienced people have with them but i you know hall of fame is a tricky conversation i'll say for a later date like does he deserve it based on his playing career? Yes, but compromising the sport is kind of different. But also we're letting people gamble, not on the baseball, but we're letting people gamble now. We have gambling sponsors. So, uh, you know, whatever you feel about the gambling situation or Pete Rose, it's worth checking out as a fan of the Reds or of baseball in general if you're not a fan of the Reds for some reason and you're listening to the Reds rundown. I don't know why you would, but just something to watch, check out. It's very well done, and I think it's a lot of interesting questions. And, again, you just can't believe how much this guy shoots himself in his own foot. I can't wait. Now, now, now I'm very intrigued. But, um yeah, guys, I think that's going to wrap it up for us. So uh, we'll, we got a couple more a couple more weeks of the Reds, Joe. So we'll try to soak them in while we can and uh, try to recover and lick our wounds from that Bengals-Patriots game. But uh, that'll do it for us, guys. So with that, we'll catch you on the next one.